mysterious objects in the skies. Local residents of Hawaii explain their encounters. With sightings over and over the skies of Hawaii, specialists will describe and give their insight on what they think they may be. Lights over Kukahaili and the Big Island of Hawaii. Local residents explain what they think they encountered and videotaped with their own video cameras. Could these objects in the skies be military exercise? We will ask the questions right here. Incredible HD video, which highlights the most fascinating cases of UFOs caught on tape in the state of Hawaii. The ancient Hawaiians refer them to the Kukahaili, the dancing lights. UFOs will be explained in this documentary. Could Hawaii be a hotspot for UFOs? Could the majestic landscape and sacred grounds be a magnet for UFOs from other planets? Or could they be Hawaiian gods coming back to the Aina? UFOs over Hawaii. Now let's begin our journey on the Hamakua coast with spiritual leader Kamaka Vivi Ole. The UFOs have been coming to the islands of Hawaii for millions of years. And they came here originally. And all they're doing is showing us that they're back again. And they want to be with us once more as a family. But the aliens have been known to us and known to the Hawaiians for a long time, but they don't speak about it. But they now want to share this, and the Hawaiians have the greatest opportunity to come out and be with them. The understanding of the Star family is the biggest thing. And we now have a great opportunity of our lifetime to be with the Star family. So let's begin this journey together. It was a long journey for the Hawaiians to find their way to Hawaii. They traveled by using and guiding their way across the Pacific, using the lights and the stars as their maps. Could they have witnessed things on the way over the ocean in the night skies that may have helped them on their journey? Evidence is here in the state of unexplained artifacts and unusual structures, along with many sightings of UFOs in the valleys riddling the islands. The UFO that came out from the valley came out from the pyramid in the back. There's a pyramid that shaped uh, portion of the valley that where the UFOs come from, they enter and exit through that portal. Now, because of that, what was seen there was them coming out, showing themselves, and they have an opportunity to now reveal that they are in that valley and have always been in that valley. And now the people can see them fly out and it will be shown more and more each time. Dr. Linda Hostelek will give us insight with the Star family and their relation with the islands. There's a grid and there's these things called telluric currents, which are electromagnetic anomalies, which um, were put in place by the ancients thousands, millions of years ago because they're beacons for them to return home. Because when the star family returns home, it's like their navigation system, where do they return to? And Hawaii is very blessed in that regard as the electromagnetic anomalies are very powerful here, very strong. Most people will come here, they will feel something, even if they don't normally feel things. For those that are sensitive, they're gonna feel a lot. It's a great place of power and healing and has been renowned throughout the universe for its healing properties. Could the Hawaiian Islands have special healing powers? And could beings from other worlds find this place irresistible? 
the largest valley on the big island of Hawaii has the mana, the power. Could this place be a magnet for UFOs? Waipio Valley, the Valley of the Kings. Well, first of all, the valley is holy. It's an absolutely sacred site, and people have been doing ceremony there for eons. The footage that I saw represented an observer ship, one that kind of checks in on things and makes sure that things are, are the way that they should be. Um, in addition, my um, feeling is that it's from Sirius. Okay, it's a Syrian ship. And there's different observer ships that are stationed throughout the entire um, globe here to check in and make sure that things are still um, pristine, that the ceremonies are still being done, that the, um, the ancestors who have passed down the traditions that they're keeping those traditions so that the energy remains high. Because when the energy is high, then the vibration is high. And again, it's like a roadmap so they know how and where to return to. What you're about to see are two videos shot by Paul Abakar of Waipio Valley. Wow, I think it's there he is. See it? Right there. A simple man who lives in a plantation home with curiosity of what goes on over his home known as Kuka Haile, the dancing lights. Paul Abakar will explain some of the most amazing encounters he's had. I was born and raised here on the big island, lived here my whole life. This is on family property, you know, we live in Kukui Haile pretty much forever we had this house. Uh, traveling light, they say is the night marchers protecting the land, you know, the spirits of the Hawaiians basically, you know, protecting the Aina. Could the military and CIA black ops be experimenting with aerial drones over the Hawaiian Islands? That day was in the kitchen just hanging out and my cousin Johnny was outside screaming. It's like, bro, come out here. I don't know what he was yelling about. So we came flying out and, and then Johnny was like, bro, it's one UFO. Like, oh, bro. Oh, what is that? It was up in the sky, it was metallic. It was just sitting there. You know, it was kind of windy that day. We didn't know what that was. Just by chance, I got to catch it on video. It was pretty amazing. Paul is a local boy. But well, Paul comes from a very long ancestral connection to the Star family. His knowledge about this here is that his family has come to see him. And this is why he, they showed up only to Paul. And he has the greatest opportunity to share this out, that his family has this type of technology. And this is why he is now going to be on a journey, knowing that this is what he saw and what was happening there is that the spinning UFO that was seen there was a UFO that was used for observation purposes. They come in and they check out the area of all of the places that needs to be kept intact because some of these places have not been kept intact and have to be taken care of. The evidence of the Hawaiian's connection to the Star family has been from day one. They have known this. This is why they have always kept 
those things that are sacred to them. Pele, Pele'ahu, all part of the star family. The problem is, is that we have taken this and driven away from it and I've asked, well, who are they? You know, why do they exist? What is Pele all about? She's all part of the star family, just like all the others that have come here, the holy ones. And this is why it's now becoming real for the people. And this island of Hawaii is the biggest place for it to happen because we have those things that exist in Mauna Kea, the volcanoes, the oceans. We have all of these areas where the UFOs can come inside and use them for their purposes. But what we're concerned about is to make sure that these places all over the earth is pristine and we do not lose balance of it. Oh, absolutely there's connection, absolutely. And I think all Native people everywhere have connections and they're the holders of the secrets. And the secrets are written here in Hawaii, but you have to have the right eyes to see, okay, the right ears to hear. Because if you have that sense of spirit and you can open up and listen, you can see the signs everywhere. You can see the guardian faces in the mountains. You can feel the energy in the certain plants. There's much healing here, and the rocks will tell you much. Pele, I mean, the fire goddess of Hawaii, the creative goddess of Hawaii. There's evidence everywhere of her. You know, it's the only place in the entire world that new earth is being created on a daily basis. That's pretty special. Craziness. Time to wake up, Paul. Time to wake up and claim your place. Yeah. There are certain individuals here that have come here with that very um, job description to wake up and to bring the knowledge to the people. There's a reason they show up in his footage because he's supposed to see them and he's supposed to bring them out to the people. You know, those aren't ordinary pictures. You know, I've seen them. You know, they're real. And when you see phenomenon like that. Um, at first you'd kind of like, no way, this can't be real, I don't believe it. But when it continues to happen over and over again in your life, that's a message from spirit that you need to take seriously and to do some soul searching and find out what is your position here. Pearl Harbor is like an island away, you know, it could have been a military drone. They do testing on on the slopes of Mauna Kea all the time. There's military bombings up there going nuts. People bring their people up there just to hear the bombs, you know, it's like, who knows what that could have been. That could have been totally military. I'm not telling you these are aliens from outer space. You know, I'm just telling you what I caught on video, you know, what my beliefs and yours might be different. It's an identified flying object, so it's a UFO in my book. I couldn't tell you what it is, or who, who, who's to say what it is. Yeah, some people tell me it's all fake, CGI. I don't even own a computer. What is CGI? You know what I mean? I'm just a man who caught amazing footage. I don't own a computer, not even a smartphone, you kidding me? Yeah, I know the difference between an airplane, helicopter, you know, there's no aircraft I've ever seen, ever. So I caught them on video, you know, you make your own decisions. Whether they be UFOs, one thing's going on for sure. The military is very active in the state of Hawaii. Well, I think that there is a cover-up. I think that most of what is released as UFO footage um, is really stuff that the government has thrown out there and wants to throw off, um, throw out there to throw people off the track. Because I think if they 
people knew what was the truth, that it would discredit the government and their whole um, perception of reality would have to shift and change. And they would no longer hold the power that they do as you know, the military industrial complex that it is today. Could UFO evidence like this and people's testimony from Hawaii bring the government to finally release and give disclosure? The red herring is like when there's a whole bunch of things thrown out there. Uh, maybe there's 20 things thrown out, but only one is real. The other ones are designed to either prove it to be fake, so that you don't believe the one that is real, or are designed to confuse and manipulate and control. Much of what the government has shown is to really cause us to ask questions. Is there always some, not something out there? They've caused so much chaos within the whole in community, the global community. It's protect what they've got. And all the incidents that have occurred here in the United States and all, all over, they have used all the technology. And basically the government and those other companies in the world have protected their sources. And we know this. And now it's coming up to the truth and the truth will be heard. Yeah, so that day I had my video camera and I was in my kitchen. Yeah, my cousin Johnny was just screaming, saying, oh, come out. I was like, so he came over here and then right there, uh, you can see him in the background. Yeah, I've been seeing lights in the sky since I was a little kid. You know, maybe we're out here isolated out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, we went out there, it looked metallic, shiny. You know, it was a real windy day, I remember. It was big, it was like 30, 15, 20 feet, like the size of my truck. It was huge. It was just sitting there for like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I've been seeing lights in the sky since I was a little kid. You know, maybe we're out here isolated, out in the middle of the ocean, Pacific Ocean. Maybe, you know, the UFOs like coming to Hawaii because we're so isolated out here, you know. Maybe they love it. Who knows? So I'll come out every night. Before I go sleep, I look at the stars with my camera to see if I can capture anything. And this one night I was out here, I looked in the sky and I was like, no, that's not no star, it was moving, it was creating this shape. I looked up and I said, it looked like a, like a bright cross. So I was like, no, that's not no star, no satellite. It doesn't move like that and make like a shape in the sky. So I just kept filming. I 
well-lit, you know, the nice moon in the sky. Uh, there's no other stars in the sky, so except this bright orb looking light shaped like a cross. Was the atmosphere, would look like it was in our atmosphere, not in the sky. You know, it was amazing. I live four miles away from a special place, Waipio, Valley of the Kings, a very sacred place, sacred burial grounds. You know, Waipio is special to the Hawaiians. Well, I just could continue to keep my eyes in the sky. I'll always have my camera out, and hopefully one day I'll have the answers to what's going on in the skies over Hawaii. Orlando Smith. A musician captures something amazing over the Hamakua coast. A military C-17 transport tracked by an unknown object. You know, I've been living in Hawaii for 20 years, about 22 years actually. And I came here originally because of the the beauty of the natural landscape. There's a lot of people, I have a lot of friends that have told me countless stories about things that they've seen, experiences and stuff. And, you know, I never really, I don't, I can't say that I believe or disbelieve. I have never really seen anything like this that has really been so unidentifiable. Just, I don't know what the heck is going on there. So I came up here to get some shots of the pink church and I look to the coast and I see this big military transport, kind of looked like a C-17 or something like that, a huge jet. I get some shots of the jet, I start videoing the jet, you know, just out of curiosity or something. And an object like the size of a minivan or something flies up behind the jet and I'm shooting the jet and I see this thing fly right in. With steady hands and calm nerves, Orlando Smith captures something amazing over the Hamakua coast. What is this object tracking the C-17? With video evidence like this, it leaves one to wonder, are we alone? If you want to really know what the truth is, there's a lot of things that have been declassified now. And so you can write and you can find them out and ask questions. And don't just take the pat answers as truth. You know, seek them out. And in your meditation and your prayers, we all have this inner knowingness of what is right and what is wrong. We're born with it. Just like the birds are born with a homing device that they can follow north and they can migrate. We have an internal compass which tells us what is truth and what is not. And listen to that internal compass. Again, most of what they're going to throw out there isn't true. And it's designed to throw you off the track. But if you listen inside and you can see the signs of what is true and you see things happen to you, perhaps there's a knowingness that you have and you find it to be true and all these dots are pointing the way to a certain direction in your life. Listen to that. That internal barometer inside of you is going to really, um, it'll put you on the right path. Orlando explains on how he was on the right path capturing his UFO. So I kept filming the, the jet and the object as I was following it across the horizon. And as I zoomed in, I was like trying to figure out what is this object? I couldn't explain what it was. How could something have flown right up to the jet and then be passing, be, be like almost attached to the jet, like it was gonna dock to the jet or something like that. I was like, is this some kind of crazy maneuver where something is approaching 
the military transport and gonna dock like in the movies or something like that. I was like, what, what is this thing? So then as I zoomed in, I'm thinking maybe it was a parachute or something that got tangled up and then somehow they were gonna bring it in because it was approaching the thing from the back. It wasn't like going off of, away from the vehicle. So I was like, what could possibly be approaching the vehicle that close? And then so when I, I, I started zooming in, you could see there's no, there's no parachute, there's no cables, there's no nothing. All you see is a big metallic object like the size of a minivan. The crazy thing is, is the shot's only 26 seconds and it seemed like, it seemed like I was shooting forever as I was following the thing across the horizon. And I still don't know what that, that other vehicle was, but I knew when I was getting this shot that this is some crazy, Thing happening here some military related so I'm still thinking it's got to be like some kind of military refueling transport you know but when I zoomed in you can see there's no lines there's no cables there's no gas refueling line there's no lines pulling the thing I mean as far as you can see and you can I zoomed it in all the way and it's like the resolution is incredible it's only 26 seconds shot but, and it, I lost it right across the horizon, like right out there. It was a beautiful day that day too, unlike today, which is totally overcast, but that day it was a spectacular day, perfect day in paradise. No clouds in the sky. I feel like I just really lucked out. I had all my gear, I was all set up. The reason why the ships come to Hawaii is one of the things is that they remove the, some of the sacred waters that are here. Lots of the planets do not have water. And so they take the water and take it to their sites in other planets or galaxies. And this is a, one of the reasons that it's so important that we keep this earth in balance and it has to be cared for. It is that sacred. There are a lot of military reservations on the Big Island, right on top of the Mauna Kea, Puakaloa training area. And you know, there's, there's a high concentration of military activity on the island that may be a factor. I never leave home without my camera after this event. I mean, I'm always looking now because I'm starting to think that a lot of these crazy stories that I've heard from friends around here there may be some truth to some of them. It is no secret that the military government and the U.S. have weapons and technology they want to keep secret. Will truth ever be revealed in regards to UFOs? The U.S. government is still going to hold up to what they have. And it's not necessary for us to go out and ask the government. It is necessary for us as a people living on this earth we are in control of what we see and what we believe. If we believe that this is happening, and it is happening, well, this is occurring, and the people got to now see the presence of their star family. It's all going to happen. A lot of the people are going to see the technology and receive it, and they're going to use it to better mankind, to balance this earth, and to do the different things that's necessary to make the changes and the shift towards balance. Pyramids throughout the world have been among us for thousands of years. We're here in the South Pacific. My name is Blake Cousins, and what lies behind me may be more evidence of ancient pyramids right here in the South Pacific. This is a massive structure. You 
could really appreciate the work put into this monument. Some of these stones are massive, weighing up to three to 400 pounds. And as you follow me along here, you could tell and see this wall just stretch for about a whole football field. This is absolutely amazing. Pyramids were built to worship their gods in the heavens. Could it be that the Hawaiians believed in outer space beings from other worlds? It is said in history this massive structure was built in a day with over 10,000 Hawaiians carrying stone to stone, man to man to build this massive structure. And we've just seen a little peek of what is actually out there. We're here now at the base of the pyramid, from the top to the bottom. And just look at the mass and length of the work that was put into this massive structure here. If you could appreciate, like me, the theory of ancient astronauts, this theoretically could be a sign from the gods. The mystery of pyramids here in the South Pacific scientifically has not been supported. But with evidence like this, how could it be denied? My name's Blake Cousins, and we'll see you again at Third Phase of Moon. In the small quaint town of Honoka'a on the Hamakua coast lives Dr. Tan Kini also owner of the Honoka'a People's Theater. He explains an extraordinary sighting he had on the island of Maui. I am Dr. Tan Kini. I am a physician in Honoka'a on the big island of Hawaii. I've been in practice in Honoka'a for 35 years. Well, it was certainly my only UFO encounter uh, that I'm aware of, at least. Um, and in order to do that, I'll have to, I think, give you uh, some preface. I've actually told this story a few times over the uh, intervening 35 years, uh, because the events I'm going to tell you about occurred 35 years ago. and. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, you know, some of the preface is important to actually understanding, uh, you know, why I um, have attached the significance I have to uh, what I saw. So this was in 1976, uh, the, I suppose, late summer. I uh, had just uh, finished residency in Queen's Hospital in Honolulu, and I uh, had six months of uh, time uh, before I would eventually uh, take a job here in Hamakua uh, as physician at the Hamakua Health Center. And um, I was just traveling around the island. I spent quite a bit of time in Maui. I had a little MG over there that, uh, but I didn't, have a, I didn't have a house to stay in, so I was just traveling around. Um, my routine was to go up to the summit of Haleakala and uh, hike down into the crater and uh, or maybe hike down uh, one side or the other and um, back and forth I just would go down and then go back up again and do it all again uh, so um, I think you have to understand how quiet it is in the crater because I think that's part of the story here um, um, you know, I remember sitting on a rock at the top of Sliding Sands Trail, which is the trail down into uh, Haleakala, and watching a lone hiker hike down the trail and listening to the crunch of his footsteps as he was uh, descending. Um, and um, after some time, I noticed that the uh, crunch of those footsteps, although receding, had I was still able to hear them when the foot changed to the other foot and then the crunch changed back again to the same foot that he had started with. Now, 
I'm not sure I can compute it accurately, but I think that that probably means I was hearing this gentleman's footsteps and he was probably about half a mile away, maybe a quarter of a mile at least. Uh, so, very quiet environment. I also remember once um, hearing the beating of wings and then looking around to, uh, to see a, a bird flying pretty far off in the distance. That's something that I had never uh, experienced before. Um, all of these are just, um, um, you know, little stories to, uh, to, I think, demonstrate just how quiet it is in the crater. Uh, and the importance of that is that um, I was staying in the crater one evening. Uh, there are cabins there. Um, uh, sometimes I would be lucky enough to get into a cabin, but most of the time I would just sleep outside with a, with a tent or sleeping bag. and. Um, I, uh, I had climbed the wall of the crater just a ways uh, above Holua Cabin, and um, so I was probably 100 feet off the ground, maybe 200 feet off the, uh, higher than the surface of the, uh, surface of the crater. And then, um, and I, I stayed there for a while, a while in fact after sunset, uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, and, uh, you know, some scenes are just hard to leave. Um, I, but in the midst of all that beauty and stillness, uh, on the rim, over the rim of the crater, and I think it was beyond Sliding Sands Trail, but over the rim of the crater, I saw two lights um, that actually emerged up over the rim and then came down and um, actually seemed as if they were um, flying inside the crater itself in the, into, uh, you know, below the level of the rim of the crater. And um, the crater is about seven miles across, uh, so it's a very big open space. You know, in those days, uh, and I guess subsequently, I have heard that there has been a number of UFO sightings um, over Haleakala, and, uh, but it's just not something I pay much attention to. I, uh, I'm, uh, like I said, I actually have had very little time to ponder those things uh, over the subsequent years. and. Uh, First of all, I, I can see it in my mind right now, of course, because it was a fascinating thing to me. I, uh, um, basically, it looked like two headlights. And again, they rose above the rim of the crater. And I would have guessed if I now, I, I haven't actually ever thought about it, but I would have imagined uh, uh, something like uh, 300, 400, 500 yards above the rim of the crater and then they came down into uh, within the rim and uh, those two headlights, uh, again, that would be the best I could uh, say. I couldn't see a body that was holding these two lights together, but I'm, I'm sure there must have been because they were in perfect unison and they went across the crater. Again, it's about seven miles across, and they disappeared into a cloud bank that was coming up out of Kalpo Gap. Kalpo Gap is kind of where, you know, millions of years ago, lava poured out of the crater into uh, down uh, uh, the, I believe, Kipahulu side of uh, Maui. And the one thing that was most uh, interesting about that. Uh, is that through all of the, and the reason I told you about the bird flapping its wings and about following the hiker down the trail, is that there was no sound whatsoever, uh, you know, as these lights uh, flew across and down into the crater and, and across the crater. And that was the thing that most impressed me, uh, you know, and kept me wondering for all of these years, occasionally, well, what was that? Um, 
what do I believe? You know, the truth is, uh, as a result of that and as a result of some people's stories that I've heard, I have a very open mind about these, these things could be, um, you know, what? Alien spacecraft? I have no idea. But uh, at least I'm open to the possibility that it's not something that is uh, explainable by the things that, uh, you know, uh, my culture has taught me. Uh, so. All right, Reynolds, this is some of the video that I thought you'd be interested in taking a look at. This was shot over the Pacific and what it shows is some kind of structure in the clouds. Is this similar to the UFO that you explained to me that you saw in Nevada? Yes, and uh, these are the type of uh, UFOs that are what they call Chatna. This is a Chatna type of UFO. The Chatna is, uh, comes from a uh, faraway galaxy. And what happens is that they, what they're doing is observation. And the reason for the observation is that many places are being checked out for not only what the people are doing, but just observe, observe them during this time and period as the transition occurs. All right, Reynolds, I want you to take a look at this video. It was apparently shot over Maui. And you know, from what I see here, is that this video indicates to me that this sighting of a UFO was people that came from the light. They indicated this and showing this that the, there is a connection between us and the star family. You know, people talk about the Galactic Federation of Lights. Is this what they're referring to? that is what they are referring to because Maui is a very strategic area for UFOs and entering and exit. People speak of interdimensional beings as well. Is there kind of a correlation between the two? Yes, because of the fact that we are together. We, we are the beings. We are here already. We don't have to wait for no one else. This is the fact that we are the ones that are completely independent of anything else in Roy Patterson Air Force Base. 60 feet down below ground. And then there's a limestone rock bed, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 feet thick. So you may be as far down as 70 feet. You're looking at uh, probably the size of a couple football fields at least in, in length. There's roughly four big vaults. They're about 100 by 100 feet in size. They got carpeting on the on the floor of the tunnels, and you could drive a pickup truck through. Colin says the most remarkable secret isn't the underground complex itself. It's what he says the Air Force was and possibly still is hiding inside. The things that were stored in these uh, vaults were, of course, bodies, alien bodies equipment used to support and maintain and preserve those bodies and medical examination tables and uh, biological testing equipment. The Air Force denied our request for an interview with a representative from the base. But local Congressman Michael Turner says plenty of classified information is at Wright Pat, and it's all with good reason. A lot of the things that are going on at wright Patterson Air Force Base are secrets that need to be protected. There are things that are in development, uh, research that we're doing, possibly for capabilities for us in the future, or even how we're looking at our potential adversaries. A statement issued to us by the base says the evolution of virtually every Air Force aircraft flying today can be traced back to wright Pat. They tell us current developments include material that can sense and then heal its own cracks, as well as bird and insect-sized aircraft capable of swarming. One of the few reporters allowed on base to investigate the legends of UFOs at Wright Pat is Emmy Award-winning newsman Carl Day. For an awful lot of unanswered questions. And tonight, 
We're going to try and sort out facts from fiction. And they said, well, come on in and look and see if you find anything. This was at the invitation of the Air Force. Aware of reports about underground chambers, Day asked to be escorted to the lowest level of Building 620. The tunnel that I went through was certainly not big enough to drive a truck through, and we had to duck out of these tunnels because they were very low. While Day didn't find hidden tunnels, he uncovered something even more shocking. It was a small mandible, which is a, the, the lower jaw of something. In the course of his reporting, Day met a dental technician from a Veterans Affairs Hospital 15 miles outside of Wright Pat, who said he had worked on a strange impression of a mandible brought from the base. At the time, the man was so afraid to tell his story that he didn't reveal his name or face. Never seen anything like this before in, in human or animal. Neither one. Today, at 81 years old, John Mosgrove speaks undisguised for the first time. I'm not going to be around too many more years, and I'd like for this story to be out, you know, because uh, I don't think the federal government is ever going to come out and say, yes, there are aliens and they are visiting us. Mosgrove says that in October of 1979, two uniformed men he recognized as officers from Wright Pat came to the VA hospital to obtain a cast of a dental impression. There was no blood and saliva. It was just dry as a bone. And I noticed right then and there I had something unusual. I thought to myself, my God, what have I got here? When Mosgrove finished the assignment, his boss made it clear not to speak of what he saw ever again. He raised his hand up like this with the impression, looked at me and crushed it and threw it into the trash. And that's when he says, forget you ever seen this, forget you ever worked on it, don't talk about it. The impression was broken. But Mosgrove dug the pieces out of the trash and put it back together so he could duplicate the cast. Convinced the mandible came from a skeleton stored at Wright Pat, Mosgrove gave a copy of the cast to Carl Day to investigate. But the case went cold when nobody Day showed it to could identify its origin. I didn't want anything to happen to it, just in case. So it's in a safe deposit box. And I've got the key. Day agreed to retrieve the mandible from his personal repository. There it is. This is the first time it's ever been shown on national television. I would love to know if this is indeed representative of true alien's lower jawbone. You can imagine how small the head must have been. 30 years after the cast was made, pressing questions remain. Could this be the smoking gun that we're all looking for? A final proof that indeed we're being visited by aliens? It proves one thing. There's something other than human and animal. Coming up, does this mandible hold the secret to extraterrestrial life? A leading dental anthropologist weighs in. And that's not even close. Right. But first, join us in the Nevada desert. Does that make you wonder what's in there that has to be so secret that they kill? As we examine exclusive video that may expose what happens inside the most secretive military base in the United States. When Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. journey leads us to one of the most mysterious military facilities on earth the legendary area 51 area 51 is a black facility which means it was created to deny its very existence you can't even approach it it's so heavily guarded so it's really hard to know exactly what the government is doing government secrecy surrounding area 51 has made the base so notorious that it's even depicted in blockbuster movies like Independence Day. In the film, Area 51 is portrayed as a massive UFO research complex, complete with flying saucers and alien bodies. After repeated requests for access to Area 51 or a representative, 
we're turned down. May I ask why we're being denied access? The Air Force issued a statement saying the area is used for testing and training for operations critical to the effectiveness of U.S. military forces and the security of the United States. And some specific activities and operations, both past and present, remain classified and cannot be discussed. Undeterred, we hit the road to find out as much as we can without breaking the law. I'm now driving to the Nevada desert a couple hours north of Las Vegas, heading to the legendary Area 51, a place that perhaps holds some of this country's biggest, deepest military secrets. And what exactly goes on there has been the source of a lot of speculation. As local tourism shows, most of the speculation centers on extraterrestrial projects. Reports of warehouses dug deep into the mountainside. There's some sort of earth-moving activity taking place in that area. Where some claim scientists are conducting reverse engineering on alien spacecraft. There was hundreds of thousands of years ahead of our technology. And most shocking of all, potential evidence that may confirm extraterrestrials exist and may have been held on the base. All claims we'll look into in the course of our investigation here. Area 51 has been veiled in secrecy since its inception. Established in 1955 as a covert test site for the U-2 spy plane, its purpose was to hide military projects. It was a place that was preoccupied with maintaining total secrecy. And secrecy then became its mission. The remote desert location labeled number 51 on this 1950s map seemed to be the perfect place for a black facility. But as the base infrastructure and activity grew, information began to leak out. The U-2 spy plane, the SR-71 spy plane, various stealth aircraft were all tested at this facility. And everything that we can see from the ground and the air indicates that this base is for aircraft testing. Despite full-scale Air Force operations on site, the government refused to acknowledge its existence. Not just initially, but for 40 years. Area 51 investigator and guide Glenn Campbell has been studying the facility since the early 90s. It was sort of like going to a drive-in movie. You could drive up and look down on the, on the secret base that the government didn't acknowledge. I'm going to meet up with Glenn Campbell. Glenn and I first met up 16 years ago uh, when I came out to this same desert trying to get answers about Area 51. This new point we're heading to is Freedom Ridge. In this report I did back in 1994, we simply drove up a nearby peak and the entire facility was revealed. From our mountain vantage point, Dreamland is a collection of unremarkable buildings. Today, the military has expanded control over land around the base. A long time. <laughs> so getting a good view won't be as easy. What will we be able to see today? Well, from the ground, we're not going to be able to see much. And I know you brought some uh, so we, we, we we have satellite photos. Increasingly better satellite imagery over the years. This is Some of the stuff is incredibly good. Look at these runways and things. Uh, it's still the best way to see it is from oh, overhead. Yeah. yeah, the security of this place is part of the intrigue. That, that's what continues to raise the level of curiosity and, and even, you know, the conspiracy theories. The, the security here is intense. I mean, look around, it's a good place to hide. <laughs> you know? it's, a, it's a damn fine place to hide. Area 51 first gained public attention in the late 80s with an explosive claim made by a physicist named Bob Lazar. He said he'd been working on a top secret project to reverse engineer alien spacecraft at a classified location near the base. He says, no, John, he said, I was in it, I touched it, it's real, it's ET, it's nothing that we could have produced. Bob Lazar declined our request to be interviewed for this program, but referred us to his good friend, John Lear, a retired pilot who flew missions for the CIA. I was the guy that exposed Area 51. Lear says he pushed Lazar to do a television interview revealing the government cover-up of alien technology. He said, yeah, just as long as I do it in shadow. The interview took place at Lear's home, and it captured the setup in this exclusive video. Taking pictures, that's Bob 
That's his wife. That's in the interview, Lazar claims to have worked on flying saucers in a secret facility called S-4. So covert, it's camouflaged by a mountain south of Area 51. John Lear describes S-4 as Lazar explained it to him. S-4 is an underground base. It just looks like a slope of a mountain, but actually they're hangar doors, and they slide up. So it looks like just part of the mountain is sliding up. And then it would lead into a laboratory, and there was a set of hangars there. Nine hangars all together, and there was a flying saucer in each different one of them, and they were all different. straight down the road. If the reports of flying saucers and reverse engineering are true, then could the government be using Area 51 as a warehouse for alien technology? Regardless of what kind of secrets the military is hiding inside Area 51, it's clear visitors aren't welcome. This is as far as, far as we can go on public land. That's the first thing that strikes me. There's no fence. Just a pair of signs. At first look, security at the base doesn't seem impressive. But soon, the complex layers of defense become apparent. I notice tripods on the hill, those are watching us. Cameras, they're looking down at us, they're looking at the road over there. You can't sneak by on this road. And if you miss that, you don't miss our friends up here on the ridge. Right. In the pickup truck. These guys are here 24 hours a day. Ground sensors, remote cameras, and private security around the clock. Yet the desert itself may still be Area 51's best protection. You know, when we came here, I expected to see a 15-foot barbed wire fence. There's no fence, just a series of these orange posts. These posts are the only uh, marker that you're required to have in Nevada to mark a boundary line. They don't need a fence here. They've got 13 miles of empty desert to protect the base. The sign's pretty typical. Warning, restricted area until you get to the bottom. Use of deadly force authorized. So we're actually three feet from being in a situation where we could be killed. Doesn't it make you wonder what's in there that, that it has to be so secret that they'd kill? Could it be true alien visitors are being held at Area 51? Airing for the first time on network television, this video purportedly shows a live extraterrestrial on the base. He's apparently being observed by military workers through a glass partition. The source of the tape is a man who goes by the name of Victor. He won't reveal his identity for fear of retribution. Victor says the video was smuggled out when material from the base was being converted from analog to digital. He discussed the video with an altered voice in this 1996 interview. Approximately twice a month, they sit it down for a session that generally lasts from three to five hours. Victor claims the alien arrived on Earth in 1989 and was subject to regular interviews. In this session, he says the alien becomes distressed. Like he's checking for hemorrhaging around the eye sockets and uh, in the nasal cavity. Victor believes the alien died in the mid-90s. We have no way to verify whether the video is authentic, but we'll take it to a creature effects expert in Los Angeles to test its plausibility. In the meantime, we scale a mountain in search of any sign of structures inside the restricted area. The point is to, to hug these orange markers. I haven't even seen the orange markers before. There's a, a, uh, yeah. a, a but, but we know the orange markers are to our right here. We're losing daylight and only have orange posts to guide us. One wrong step into the invisible border means we could be arrested. I see a structure off right. in the distance. What are we looking at there? That's the actual guardhouse. That's the actual gate within it the uh, Nellis range so if you were to keep driving on the road past those signs and you got to that guardhouse you'd be arrested immediately we continue to climb upwards until we can't go any farther well this is as high as we can get it looks like we're at the end of our journey because I see your what do you call them camo guys yeah the camo dudes are here there. and some orange markers here this is as far as we can go this is where the border changes I think our only option is uh, is to get in the air uh, during daylight and uh, you know, maybe I'll be able to get a glimpse and uh, you know, get some idea of what's in Area 51. But we're going to need daylight and a chopper. 
Coming up, join us in the skies above the Nevada desert as we take you as close as you can get to the most infamous military base in the country. They now know who we are and where we are. That's correct. Is Area 51 the epicenter for a cover-up of alien life? Or is the base concealing earthly secrets that are much more disturbing? Find out what happened at Area 51 and what humans did. That's scary enough. When Inside Secret Government Warehouses continues. happens inside Area 51 are the employees, and their identities, even down to the cleaning staff, are kept secret. That white bus with the darkened windows, we're told, ferries local workers from area around Area 51 who come here to work each day. Those not bussed in are flown in, shuttled back and forth on special unmarked planes. They fly on a private airline known over aircraft frequencies as Janet, every morning from Las Vegas to Area 51. This surveillance video shows workers returning from Area 51 on private 737s. These are jets without any company markings. They just have a red stripe down the side. Signing on to work at the base means agreeing to a covert lifestyle. No one can even admit that they work there. Jonathan Turley, a litigator in national security cases, first learned about Area 51 in 1994 when he was contacted by employees who were gravely ill. You're basically told to go die. And they weren't supposed to talk to a lawyer and they weren't supposed to talk to a doctor. Despite having signed non-disclosure agreements, some workers told Turley they'd been exposed to toxic materials on base. One of them was a sheet metal worker named Robert Frost. He couldn't tell the doctors where he was working or what he might have been exposed to. They could have put him in jail for it. In 1994, I conducted this interview with Frost's widow, Helen. She told me about the first day her husband came home with symptoms. He walked in a door and he was screaming. I looked at him, his face was bright red and all the skin was peeling off of his face. Turley filed a lawsuit accusing the military of poisoning Area 51 workers through blatant negligence by recklessly disposing of hazardous waste. They dug a football field sized trench and they would fill it every week with all types of hazardous and toxic wastes. And then they would just dump jet fuel on it and set it on fire. Though the base was operating in secret, Turley says the impact on some workers was difficult to hide. Many of them developed a strange condition that looked like fish scales on their body. This was taken uh, just before he quit in March of 89. And then he had these large sores on his back. He had those all over his body. Turley's clients wanted to know what they were exposed to, but suing for information was a Kafkaesque task. At the time, the government denied Area 51 even existed. At one point, I just told the judge, Your Honor, I can take you there. I can point you to it. You can see it. How can it not exist as a matter of physics, let alone the law? Turley says it wasn't until he obtained satellite photos of the base that the government finally acknowledged some operations in the general area. They believed that they lived in a special place that was not reachable by federal law, that even killing someone uh, it was just simply not something to be held accountable for. Eventually, Turley filed several lawsuits on behalf of sick workers. The legal battle lasted for nine years. Some of his clients died during this time. The lawsuits succeeded in prompting the government to start conducting environmental inspections on the base as required by law. And as a result, the court found one of the cases to be moot. Another one was dismissed for reasons of national security. In the end, Turley's clients got no answers. And disclosure of the legal inspections prompted by the lawsuit was deemed subject to a presidential exemption. This means they can be kept from the public, and they have been to this day. This is 
a failure of immense proportions. It goes not just from the Air Force command at the facility, but extends all the way to the president himself. These were Americans. They had to be protected from their own government. Turley says all the stories about aliens at the base have provided the military with an ideal smokescreen. If everyone's looking for some galactic presence, they're not looking down on Earth for simple crimes. And so the government never really did try to kill the alien stories. They just wanted to kill the crime story. And so, public interest in Area 51 and its alien legends has endured. Tourists come from all over just to get a glimpse inside the border. There's all the signs and all the cameras watching you up in the hills and the guys in the trucks. It's like, okay, what do you really not want us to see that's back here? Like, what is it that you want hidden so well? Major land restrictions in the 1980s and 1990s have closed off nearly every reasonable land-based vantage point into the facility. So we concoct another plan. We really couldn't see anything from the ground, but we have another option. Uh, we've hired a helicopter, and we're going to go up and try to skirt around the restricted area and see what we can see. Campbell, please meet you. The sky is also now the focus for investigator Glenn Campbell as he prepares to monitor activity in the restricted airspace above the base with high-powered surveillance cameras. I have three cameras recording 72 hours worth of video. These three specialized cameras will record continuously and capture anything unusual overhead, day or night. The idea is have Bald Mountain on one side, have this small peak on the other side. Looks nicer. As we await the results, I head off to do some aerial surveillance of my own. All right, Tom? I'm Tom. It takes several calls before finding a pilot willing to take us anywhere near Area 51. Well, these are restricted areas, and why they're restricted areas, they don't tell us. How close can we legally get? Well, uh, it's recommended that you don't get closer than about two miles to the border. Are we going to tell them what we're doing? No, no, we're not going to tell them. We're just going to tell them we're going to be doing some flying looking the area over if they ask. Let's do it. All right. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Squad 4373 and I guess. During our ascent, we overhear communications between air traffic controllers and the unmarked government commuter jets. Janet 267, L control radar contact, maintain no one 5000. That uh, airplane he's talking to is one of the Janet airplanes, like an aerial bus service. Once we've flown over the highest mountain, Area 51 creeps into view. I can actually see it from here. We're probably about uh, 10 miles from the border. But just as soon as the base is within sight, a warning comes over the radio. Helicopter 966 Sierra Hotel, you familiar with that restricted airspace? Three miles to your west. 966 Sierra Hotel, affirmative. I'll be turning now. I won't get any closer than two miles to the restricted airspace. Copy that. It's clear that again, like on the ground, we're being observed. We are as close as we will be allowed to go to Area 51. This place is so restrictive that we legally can't even point our cameras in the direction of the base. We're at a little over 8,500 feet. It's a beautiful, clear day. This is absolutely the best view that anyone will be able to get of Area 51 from outside the restricted zone. I'm going to be able to tell you what I see as I look out. There are, there are two what must be very, very large buildings, uh, aluminum roofs. They shine, uh, they shine very brightly. I, I can only surmise that they are hangars of some sorts. There are a number of lower-lying buildings. All of it seems to be along the, the edge of a dry lake bed. There is what appears to be a, a very long, long runway. Our investigation has revealed as much visible evidence of the base as legally possible from the ground and from the air. I'm guessing they're a little more comfortable uh, when we're leaving this area. More than likely. <laughs> and if we've learned anything, it's that the government is intent on keeping what's hidden inside this legendary military base a secret.
After 72 hours monitoring the sky, our video surveillance captures some anomalies. An eerie desert storm sweeps through the area. A bright light floats along the horizon after dark. And then we discover this glowing disk in the corner of the screen. Upon examination, the light turns out to be a car driving on the desolate road. The disk, however, remains unexplained. Campbell says it could be the moon. When you come to the desert and you look up at the night sky, you see more stars than you would ever see any place else. When you look up at all those million points of light, you've got to be crazy to believe we're alone in the universe. Coming up, our investigation continues as we travel from coast to coast to analyze the evidence we've discovered on our journey. What will the purported alien interview video from Area 51 reveal? And could this mandible support theories of extraterrestrial life? It's, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. Answers coming up next on Inside Secret Government Warehouses. investigation into secret government warehouses culminates with analysis of the potential smoking guns we've uncovered. Does this video of an alleged alien interview at Area 51 reveal the truth about life beyond Earth? And could this mandible prove alien remains have been hidden on bases like Wright Pat for decades? We'll explore all the possibilities with top experts, starting with one of the most sought-after creature effects artists in Hollywood. I'm looking for that one piece of footage that is undeniable, that, that I, I can't look at or other people can't analyze to death. Kevin Yeager designs creatures, aliens, and humans for a living, most notably Chucky from Child's Play and a nightmare on Elm Street's Freddy Krueger. Jaeger agrees to analyze the video using 25 years of experience in puppeteering and film. The first thing that I saw, you know, was an alien, and it actually looked uh, like it was alive. If you look closely, you can see there's a small little mouth. It kind of looks like it's, you know, pursing and moving like a natural mouth would. It's got big doughy eyes, it's got a big head, and it moves in a pathetic way, and you want to take care of it you know and suddenly your heart is involved just as Jaeger starts to identify with the alien he spots questionable movement there's some quick jarring movements that uh, every now and then see this little jerk bobble head that happens here uh, right there is kind of a jerk bobble, and, and the shoulders move as well a telltale sign he says that the alien is a puppet it's the head movement that tips Jaeger off and he uses this animatronic doll to explain now if you go slowly like it was first moving very slowly, you can kind of take all the bobbles out. But then once he began to get kind of tired or go into his, his sick state, he began to wiggle and jiggle like this. And then that's when it kind of gives it away. But when dealing with a life form we know nothing about, Jaeger admits anything is possible. Maybe the atmosphere here is different and the, and the pressure and they can't handle it and, it's, and the gravity it is too hard on them so they do bobble. Still, Jaeger says it looks like the setup is hiding something. The darkness of the videotape, uh, the fact that the alien is, is sort of back behind a desk, I believe that that is to obscure uh, a possible puppeteer behind there. Jaeger thinks the alien and the video are a hoax, but he says it wasn't a bad try. There's certain organic elements to it, and I can totally see why people would think this is real. Hoaxes do nothing but undermine efforts to get to the truth. With that in mind, we head to New York City to visit NYU dental anthropologist Shara Bailey. She has been studying the mandible we obtained during our investigation at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The jaw shape is what struck me first, because the shape of this jaw is very narrow in the front part, and, it, and then it kind of dips in here, and then it's very wide in the back. And, and this is very unusual so it, it for makes, a primate. So it makes this curve and then comes out. Yeah, it's kind of like an S curve, I guess you might call it. And certainly our, our teeth don't, and jaws don't do that. No, they don't. Dr. Bailey has 2,000 primate casts, one of the largest collections in the nation, and she's compared the mandible to every single one. Can you say with any fair amount of certainty that this is not from a primate? Yes, I, I, would, I would put my career on it that it's not from a primate. Although Bailey can't match the mandible to anything she's ever seen, her examination of the cast does reveal new information. 
The cast was made from a skeleton. And this is of a living person. Because, because we you, see the gum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the gum, and you absolutely can't see the gum here. The creature lost its teeth after it died. Uh, and there are also crypts. Uh, you can see that where, where the teeth might have been. The remaining teeth show it was an omnivore. It's something that eats both flesh and vegetables. And dimensions of a jaw indicate the size of the creature itself. This is a macaque, um, but it has a jaw, a, a jaw similar in size to this. And so whatever this creature was, it was the size of a small dog. And the skull size would be similar as well to match this? Yeah, there's a very good uh, correlation between jaw size and skull size. The cast has some characteristics that strike Bailey as peculiar, including signs of being scraped with a tool. It's definitely been modified. So that, that I can tell you. Whether it's um, authentic and it was modified for some other reason, I, you know, it's very hard to tell. She also questions the apparent human-like dental pattern which could disprove the notion that the cast came from an alien skeleton. If it's an, we're an alien and they evolved on a different planet, totally separate from us, why would we ever expect it to have the dental pattern, the same number of teeth and the same types of teeth as a human? It's just, it's very odd. If in fact this came from another planet, how would you begin to really compare it to find out what it is? All I can do is, is, is compare it to living things on this planet. This mandible is not of any creature that comes from our Earth, that's for sure. This alleged alien artifact tied to our nation's most complex Air Force base may be just the tip of the iceberg of what the government doesn't want us to know. Could this be one of the many secrets locked away in classified government warehouses around the globe? And is there a real Warehouse 13? In the end, we can't say for certain what's below ground or hidden behind closed doors. What we do know is that there will always be information those in power don't want us to know about. And as a society, we have the right and the responsibility to keep asking, to keep pushing, to discover what they don't want us to know and why. I'm Lester Holt. Thank you for watching. <laughs>
What you're about to see are two videos shot by Paul Abakar of YPO Valley. Wow, A simple man who lives in a plantation home with curiosity of what goes on over his home known as Kuka Haile, the dancing lights. Paul Abakar will explain some of the most amazing encounters he's had. I was born and raised here on the big island, lived here my whole life. This is on family property. You know, we live in Kukui Haile pretty much forever we had this house. Uh, traveling light, they say is the night marchers protecting the land. You know, the spirits of the Hawaiians basically, you know, protecting the Aina. Could the military and CIA black ops be experimenting with aerial drones over the Hawaiian Islands? That day was in the kitchen just hanging out and my cousin Johnny was outside screaming. It's like, bro, come out here. I don't know what he was yelling about. So we came flying out and, and then Johnny was like, bro, it's one UFO. Like, It was up in the sky, it was metallic. Yeah, so that day I had my video camera and I was in my kitchen. Yeah, my cousin Johnny was just screaming. Saying, oh, come out. I was like, so we came over here. And then right there, uh, you can see them in the background. Yeah, I've been seeing lights in the sky since I was a little kid. You know, maybe we're out here isolated, out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, we went out there, it looked metallic, shiny. You know, it was a real windy day, I remember. It was big, it was like dirt. 15, 20 feet, like the size of my truck. It was huge. It was just sitting there for like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I've been seeing lights in the sky since I was a little kid. You know, maybe we're out here isolated, out in the middle of the ocean, Pacific Ocean. Maybe, you know, the UFOs like coming to Hawaii because we're so isolated out here, you know? Maybe they love it, who knows? So I'll come out every night before I go sleep. I look at the stars with my camera to see if I can capture anything. And this one night I was out here, I looked in the sky and I was like, no, that's not no star, it was moving was creating this shape. I looked up and I said, it looked like a, like a bright cross. So I was like, no, that's not no star, no satellite. It doesn't move like that and make like a shape in the sky. So I just kept filming.
A well lit, you know, the nice moon in the sky. Uh, there's no other stars in the sky, so except this bright orb looking like shaped like a cross. was the atmosphere would look like it was in our atmosphere, not in the sky. It was amazing. I live four miles away from a special place, Waipio, Valley of the Kings, a very sacred place, sacred burial grounds. You know, Waipio is special to the Hawaiians. Well, I just could continue to keep my eyes in the sky. I'll always have my camera out, and hopefully one day I'll have the answers to what's going on in the skies over Hawaii. Orlando Smith. A musician captures something amazing over the Hamakua coast, a military sea. Pearl Harbor is like an island away, you know, it could have been a military drone. They do testing on, on the slopes of Mauna Kea all the time. There's military bombings up there going nuts. People bring their people up there just to hear the bombs, you know? It's like, who knows what that could have been? That could have been totally military. I'm not telling you these are aliens from outer space. You know, I'm just telling you what I caught on video, you know, what my beliefs in yours might be different. It's an identified flying object, so it's a UFO in my book. I couldn't tell you what it is, or who, who, who's to say what it is? Yeah, some people tell me it's all fake, CGI. I don't even own a computer. What is CGI? You know what I mean? I'm just a man who caught amazing footage. I don't own a computer, not even a smartphone. You kidding me? Yeah, I know the difference between an airplane, helicopter. You know, there's no aircraft I've ever seen ever so i caught them on video you know you make your own decisions whether they be ufos one thing's going on for sure the military's very active in the state of hawaii well i think that there is a cover-up I think that most of what is released as UFO footage um, is really stuff that the government has thrown out there and wants to throw off, um, throw out there to throw people off the track. Because I think if they, people knew what was the truth, that it would discredit the government and their whole um, perception of reality would have to shift and change. And they would no longer hold the power that they do as you know, the military industrial complex that it is today. Could UFO evidence like this and people's testimony from Hawaii bring the government to finally release and give disclosure? The red herring is like when there's a whole bunch of things thrown out there uh, maybe there's 20 things thrown out, but only one is real. The other ones are designed to either prove it to be fake, so that you don't believe the one that is real, or are designed to confuse and manipulate and control. Much of what the government has shown is to really cause us to ask questions. 
is there always some, not something out there. They've caused so much chaos within the whole in community, the global community. It's protect what they've got. And all the incidents that have occurred here in the United States and all, all over, they have used all the technology. And basically the government and those other companies in the world have protected their sources. And we know this. And now it's coming up to the truth and the truth will be heard. was just sitting there. You know, it was kind of windy that day. We didn't know what that was. Just by chance, I got to catch it on video. It was pretty amazing. Paul is a local boy, but Paul comes from a very long ancestral connection to the Star family. His knowledge about this here is that his family has come to see him. And this is why he, they showed up only to Paul. And he has the greatest opportunity to share this out that his family has this type of technology. And this is why he is now gonna be on a journey, knowing that this is what he saw, and what was happening there is that the spinning UFO that was seen there was a UFO that was used for observation purposes. They come in and they check out the area of all of the places that needs to be kept intact because some of these places have not been kept intact and have to be taken care of. The evidence of the Hawaiians' connection to the Star family is a bit from day one. They have known this. This is why they have always kept those things that are sacred to them. Pele, Pele'ahu, all part of the star family. The problem is, is that we have taken this and driven away from it and have asked, well, who are they? You know, why do they exist? What is Pele all about? She's all part of the star family, just like all the others that have come here, the holy ones. And this is why it's not becoming real for the people. And this island of Hawaii, it's the biggest place for it to happen because we have those things that exist in Mauna Kea, the volcanoes, the oceans. We have all of these areas where the UFOs can come inside and use them for their purposes. But what we're concerned about is to make sure that this place is all over the earth is pristine and we do not lose balance of it. Oh, absolutely there is connection, absolutely. And I think all Native people everywhere have connections, and they're the holders of the secrets. And the secrets are written here in Hawaii, but you have to have the right eyes to see, okay, the right ears to hear. Because if you have that sense of spirit, and you can open up and listen, you can see the signs everywhere. You can see the guardian faces in the mountains. You can feel the energy in the certain plants. You know? There's much healing here and the rocks will tell you much. Pele, I mean, the fire goddess of Hawaii, the creative goddess of Hawaii, there's evidence everywhere of her. You know, it's the only place in the entire world that new earth is being created on a daily basis. That's pretty special. Craziness. Time to wake up, Paul. It's time to wake up and claim your place. You know? There are certain individuals here that have come here with that very um, job description to wake up and to bring the knowledge to the people. There's a reason they show up in his footage because he's supposed to see them and he's supposed to bring them out to the people. You know, those aren't ordinary pictures. You know, I've seen them. You know, they're real. 
And when you see phenomenon like that, um, at first you kind of like, no way, this can't be real, I don't believe it. But when it continues to happen over and over again in your life, that's a message from spirit that you need to take seriously and to do some soul searching and find out what is your position here. Mysterious objects in the skies. Local residents of Hawaii explain their encounters. With sightings over and over the skies of Hawaii, specialists will describe and give their insight on what they think they may be. Lights over Kukahaili and the Big Island of Hawaii. Local residents explain what they think they encountered and videotaped with their own video cameras. Could these objects in the skies be military exercise? We will ask the questions right here. Incredible HD video, which highlights the most fascinating cases of UFOs caught on tape in the state of Hawaii. The ancient Hawaiians refer them to the Kukahaili, the dancing lights. UFOs will be explained in this documentary. Could Hawaii be a hotspot for UFOs? Could the majestic landscape and sacred grounds be a magnet for UFOs from other planets? Or could they be Hawaiian gods coming back to the Aina? Now let's begin our journey on the Hamakua coast with spiritual leader Kamaka Vivi Ole. The UFOs have been coming to the islands of Hawaii for millions of years. And they came here originally. And all they're doing is showing us that they're back again. And they want to be with us once more as a family. But the aliens have been known to us and known to the Hawaiians for a long time, but they don't speak about it. But they now want to share this, and the Hawaiians have the greatest opportunity to come out and be with them. The understanding of the Star family is the biggest thing. And we now have a great opportunity of our lifetime to be with the Star family. So. Let's begin this journey together. It was a long journey for the Hawaiians to find their way to Hawaii. They traveled by using and guiding their way across the Pacific, using the lights and the stars as their maps. Could they have witnessed things on the way over the ocean in the night skies that may have helped them on their journey? Evidence is here in the state of unexplained artifacts and unusual structures, along with many sightings of UFOs in the valleys riddling the islands. The UFO that came out from the valley came out from the pyramid in the back. There's a pyramid shaped uh, portion of the valley that where the UFOs come from. They enter and exit through that portal. Now, because of that, what was seen there was them coming out, showing themselves, and they have an opportunity to now reveal that they are in that valley and have always been in that valley. And now the people can see them fly out and it will be shown more and more each time. Dr. Linda Hostelek will give us insight with the Star family and their relation with the islands. <laughs> 